when we're working in a conventional office setting, we may take for granted some of the institutional protections that are built in. So for instance, if you're in an office, uh, your offices may all be uh, segregated behind a receptionist or in an area where, uh, where, the, where clients don't naturally have an ability uh, to walk around. Consequently, confidential and privileged information would naturally be open. It's, my guideline to people is always to just to put themselves in that mindset and then start to imagine how that would translate at home. And the obvious thing is uh, files left around uh, on the kitchen table or in the home office and open uh, is, is something that clearly shouldn't be done. You need to be mindful of that home work environment or that re uh, remote space to ensure that you can protect client information. Now, some of you may take the view um, that you can can operate within a in a physical setting, which is to say with paper files and have a filing cabinet that can be locked up. Others may reinterpret that and say, we're gonna go entirely digital, I'll invest um, a few hundred dollars in a very high powered scanner and all physical files will be rendered digitally and so that by the end of my work day, uh, I have a completely clean desk, everything is on glass and, uh, and there's a nice uh, paper shredder in the corner that's eliminated any documentation that has been printed over the course of the day. Uh, whatever works for you ultimately uh, will work as long as it's within these guidelines. But um, the, the remote work um, attitude has to be one that would, be, that would work very well in a conventional office space in that you are protecting your client's privileged and confidential information. Exactly. So we'll kick over here to the the mechanisms. So as far as confidentiality and privilege, we all understand what the basic obligations are. However, when it comes to being at home and figuring out whether, especially if you're on your own, obviously on this call, there are people who are in-house and just dealing with corporate support for setting up a remote work environment. Obviously in that situation, an IT person would be uh, your best friend at this moment in time, obviously, hopefully. And for those of us who are doing it on our own, there is a little bit of a learning curve. I certainly went through it. And the biggest thing that I can say, if I can help you to not make some of the more challenging um, mistakes that I think I made at the beginning, the biggest one was I tried to work with a, a giant practice management software that I didn't really need. And I would recommend that you really shop for the one that you do need. So there are a bunch of options you can look for, consider what your practice is. Some, some practices have completely different requirements than others. Some practices are very intake heavy. Some have high volume. Some are just a few clients with a high volume of work. You really have to consider what is your practice. In my case, I was able to figure out a system that worked for me, which we'll get into more later. But the starting point was, what do I need to do in my day? What, how do I protect my client information? And when you come home, the first couple of things to do are really to get educated, I think, on how to do that. So Wi-Fi. I mean, the basic, basic thing to start with is making sure our Wi-Fi is secure in our homes, making sure that we have enough bandwidth to cover off our client needs, particularly with all these Zoom calls and remote work type of situations it's the best package that you can get for internet will be very important peter jump in here anytime on any of this stuff well on the the, the wi-fi point i think is helpful certainly for your home wi-fi you should uh, upgrade to whatever is the 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 broadest amount of bandwidth that you can get into your home or remote location um and and you know frankly the the major providers rogers and bell provide uh, a pretty at least in metropolitan areas provide pretty good uh, bandwidth to be able to support that uh, but if you're a remote worker you're not just going to work uh, from your house you will uh, work from a variety of locations including your clients locations or maybe a variety of coffee shops uh, you need to educate yourself on uh, security when if you are going to access public Wi-Fi networks. Some people won't. They'll use a hotspot off their phone by way of an example. That's secure. 
Uh, but you can also get a VPN service in order to allow you to access uh, free public internet, but without compromising the digital uh, integrity of your network and of your laptop and client's information. Uh, if you're not familiar with VPN, at the end of the meeting, type it into Google. You'll get a number of services they offer, very cheap uh, monthly subscriptions. Uh, and that's something that, uh, that you should seriously consider um, in order to protect information and allow you to work securely in a number of remote co locations. Yeah, I think a lot of people consider the remote workforce to be working at Starbucks and logging into public Wi-Fi. And as lawyers, we don't do that without having to do a whole bunch of learning about what the risks are and how to secure our data to Peter's point. So we also have to consider a cloud document and email management. So obviously everyone on this call will have been using, well, maybe not everyone, but email is generally in the cloud. You're using Microsoft Office or Outlook or whatever email provider you have. Um, but there's all kinds of other document management issues that comes up. And for you, if you have been using paper files, it's interesting for Peter and I because I think we have been working in a world of not having paper files for a while. I'm not sure that we're going to be able to give the, the best advice on how to transition today in, from paper to, to online, but I think the key for me has been throughout just to have a good system and a good, uh, something that I trust, something that's easy to navigate, doesn't have too many additional steps. Many of us will now be working in a world without admin support that's as readily available. And if that's the case, honestly, something that you can understand that has good documentation, that you understand the security, you can read the terms of service, that's the ultimate cloud management system. And I personally, I really love just having everything digitally available without having to go between paper and digital all the time. Peter's nodding, but I'll, I'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is, as I said about the secure, the wireless router in your home being secure, that's key. But you also need antivirus software for your computer. If you haven't prioritized that in the past, now would be the time. There's some really good intel and advice on that from the Law Society about what, they, what to look for. And as well, a backup system for your data. So if you're, if, even if you're using a cloud service, do you have anything on your actual laptop? If so, how are you backing it up? How do your backups work? At this early setup stage, there is just a lot of learning about what's happening with your data and your documents. It's pretty unavoidable to read about it. Yeah, and, and so on that point, um, certainly speaking for myself, uh, I. I've been learning about this for years and frankly, there's, I don't think a week goes by that I don't uh, learn something new uh, when it comes to uh, digital security and protecting the integrity of our system. And, uh, and sometimes I learn things that are new that frankly catch me off guard and that I don't expect. So it's a constant process. You, for those of you that are dealing with this in real time right now, uh, there are services out there. There are, I don't want to, Listen, we're going to probably name a few commercial providers out here. These are not necessarily endorsements, but I, like, I think this is probably a good time to start talking about some of the actual tools that are available. But I use a, uh, a third-party service that is a, effectively an independent IT professional. We've used them since day one at Conduit Law since 2012, and uh, they're available. Uh, they are located in, uh, in the GTA. Uh, they have a telephone service. I, frankly, treat them very much like you would treat a conventional IT solution. Um, but they're able to uh, support us. They're able to ensure everything is secure. They're able to give us cloud-based tools, manage our cloud-based tools. They're able to troubleshoot problems. And they're able to give us really good, timely uh, information on how to ensure that we're taking uh, all the precautions necessary. We use a company, they're called Outhouse IT. Uh, but there's a number of them that are like that where you effectively can uh, subscribe for a, a nominal monthly amount uh, that is significantly less than having to make the large investment of hiring a full-time IT person. And, and then you're able to also manage the security issues. So uh, you should not feel like you are all alone. Uh, as a lawyer, you're, you'll be responsible for understanding uh, how you comply with bylaws and uh, the law society and the rules around that, but you shouldn't feel like you're all alone. You should actively uh, seek out some of those types of resources that can help you secure the data in your practice. 
uh, and, and do it in a way that allows you to work remotely, uh, but with uh, full connectivity to your clients and your coworkers. That's a great point. And small firms are a great resource for companies that they've worked with, like the one Peter just named, where they've dealt with lawyers and law firms, because I think there is something different. For example, I wouldn't be comfortable giving my laptop or any of my devices to the Best Buy counter and leaving it overnight. I mean, obviously that's not something that we can be doing. So we need to be considering just things that work for other people. We have to look at them through the lens of being dealing with confidential information all the time. And Peter and I laughed a little bit about the privilege of public conversations. It is the nature of a remote lawyer that you've got to have conversations with your clients sometimes. And if you are working in between client offices or between meetings out in public, many of us will have had this issue, but we did joke that we spend a lot of time having conversations in our cars, uh, ideally not on the very loud Bluetooth that you can sometimes hear other people <laughs> through the window. Um, but you do have to consider, obviously, a lot of even co-working spaces that's not relevant at this exact point in time. But if it comes back online, and you're working in a co-working space, we have to choose as lawyers the ones that have the secure, quiet phone booths for those types of conversations. Yeah, it's pretty glamorous to be um, uh, in the parking lot um, outside of the Starbucks, not actually in the Starbucks, but in the parking lot across from the Starbucks to have a private and confidential phone call. Uh, yes. That's the kind of glamorous life that us remote workers uh, get to live. It is. Okay, so file management. Peter, do you want to lead this one off? Yeah, so there's a, there's a number of different uh, commercial products out, out that are available out there. Um, Clio is probably one of them, and certainly people in the Ryerson community would be most probably very familiar with Clio. Uh, we use Clio, so uh, full disclosure on that. Uh, I'm not, not here to pitch their services, uh, but we have been very happy with them. And what, what these types of services do... Um, there's another one that's uh, relatively new in the market called Matter 365. Uh, they're a good bunch of people, and there's other services that are available. What's the, is there Dragon Lawyer or, uh, I don't know. So many, Rocket Matter, I Ro think. Rocket Matter, Practice Rocket Matter. The um, these services, uh, the, the beauty of them for anybody who's starting out or making the transition over is that it's effectively a law firm in a box. Uh, you pay a small monthly subscription. Uh, these are SaaS based solutions. Uh, they have excellent utility and you're able to take all the steps from client onboarding through to document management and matter management uh, down to uh, time recording if you're a billable hour type of lawyer, uh, all the way then to invoicing. And a lot of them also offer some rudimentary um, uh, bookkeeping and accounting uh, components to their solution and this is this becomes a very very rapid way of being able to uh, really put your arms around if you will all elements of your commercial practice um, in a manner that's secure that's uh, cloud-based and that is then also scalable which allows you to ultimately add additional lawyers or other co-workers or colleagues in uh, to the system if you need it one of the you know, when we when I first started working in this remote way back in uh, 2004, 2005, uh, one of the challenges was there were no SaaS based cloud solutions that allowed me to network with others. Uh, everything was on one laptop. It's very insecure. Uh, you know, of course, all the uh, all the dangers ranging from pouring a cup of coffee onto my laptop to having it stolen uh, or it just dying. Uh, none of those things uh, are actual systemic risks to your remote law firm if you use a cloud-based solution. Uh, so I can't stress enough the, the need to find a good one uh, and one that meets your needs. And of course, you should also do your own due diligence as to whether or not it complies with, uh, with whatever obligations um, you feel uh, need to be strictly adhered to. Uh, but uh, file management, critically important. Look for something cloud-based and look for something scalable. And my whole thing is the fewer the fields, <clears throat> the, the, if you can create for yourself a simplified practice, one of the opportunities right now is that if you're able to start your own practice, 
we don't have to mirror and duplicate the way things have always been done. We can really take steps to be very, very targeted in what we need to do. So in my own practice, for example, I view the intake and the invoicing parts of the practice as very, very important, very, the one, those are the pieces where if there's going to be something you have to change or it doesn't quite fit the mold of the automated standardized practice management software, you need to consider again, back to your own practice, how it works. Try to avoid creating systems that are just admin heavy for the sake of it and try to just acknowledge the fact that the simpler, the more streamlined our practice is, technology should support that streamlining, not create more layers to something that could be simple. So I think for everyone, that's going to be different. Yeah. So don't, when we, when I was starting out down this road, um, I think historically, if, if I was doing this a very long time ago and was starting out with my own law firm, my template would have been the law firm that I left, which is to say, well, this is how they did it there. I'm talking if we were starting this process 30 years ago, I would have just tried to replicate that template. When I started Conduit, my, my default was the opposite, which is to say my default was if a conventional, traditional bricks and mortar law firm is doing something, uh, in a certain way, I, my default from an analytical point of view was the exact opposite. If they're doing it in a certain way, I am not going to do it that way. I'm going to find a different way to do it. That is tech enabled, digital, uh, SaaS supported, uh, because my understanding and what, uh, the way I looked at the conventional law firms was they evolved in a certain way. They started to layer on certain technological tools and then they would have to have had, they would have had to have bolted on additional tools as and when, and ultimately left themselves with very expensive infrastructures. You don't have to start with an expensive infrastructure. You don't have to start with a very complicated infrastructure. You don't have to start with an infrastructure that requires a significant amount of external support. They will require some external support, but not a significant amount of external support. And I don't know if that would work for everybody. I'm not saying that it has to work for everybody, but from an analytical framework um, and, and just from the point of view of how I was uh, approaching the problem, if it was being done in a certain way by a conventional law firm, that was that was already a strike against it. I, already, I would look a different way. For sure. And depending if you're a solo or small, your needs really are different. So what works for a big firm are the systems that need to be put in place to deal with many, many, many lawyers with many different practice areas. We don't have that as, a, as something to grapple with. So you've got flexibility on that front. Keep going. Or you want That's to probably it? a good segue to getting paid. Okay. All righty. Getting paid. So can I start this one off? Please. The, uh, if you are a solo or a small firm, um, uh, getting paid, uh, listen, getting paid is important for everybody. Uh, ultimately, uh, cash flow is the oxygen supply uh, to any business. And we're going to learn that uh, in real time right, right across the economy. Um, that having been said, if you are a small business, whether you're a small law firm or a small popsicle stand, it doesn't really matter, uh, managing your month-to-month uh, -month obligations is going to be critically important. Just think of cash as oxygen and you need it to get from month to month. Uh, conventional law firms, big law firms have big infrastructures and accounting departments and invoicing departments to manage all of that. They also tend to have very large uh, lines of credit. And, and if you're an associate, a mid-level associate, uh, you never really concern yourself with those issues. But if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a business owner and you're in a small uh, law firm, then you need to be very, very, uh, you need to pay very close attention to this and be really uh, finely tuned into issues around financial hygiene. So these are some of the things that I talk to lawyers uh, about all the time. First of all, stop the practice of monthly billing. Um, a lot of places will bill at the end of the month just because it's the end of the month. Uh, you should bill when a matter is complete. Uh, you've done the work, 
Um, hopefully the client is happy with it. If they are happy with it, the likelihood of them paying you is significantly higher. Uh, the longer you wait from the day that you deliver the service to when you invoice for the service, uh, the more likely it is for the client to forget that happy, warm and fuzzy feeling that they have today. So invoicing should be done uh, contemporaneously or as contemporaneously as possible with delete, completing the work. Uh, some of you will say that you're working on a complicated matter and it's a big thing and you shouldn't build to the end. Uh, in those cases, we break up the matter into phases or stages and we tell clients that they're going to get interim bills along the way um, you know frankly as a practice management matter it also helps because uh, nothing focuses people's attention on their satisfaction with the service than when they get an invoice and so if they're uh, not happy you'll figure it out very very quickly so frequent billing not just monthly interim invoicing uh, when necessary um, I also, and this, uh, this may or may not be suitable for you. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I actually don't know that many people who do what I'm about to tell you that I do, but I, I found it to be quite effective. Um, I, for, um, if not all, uh, certainly very many of our clients, we put in an incentive for fast pay. So I put in a 2.5% discount for invoices that are paid within 10 days. Uh, and and the reason I did that is that uh, in our experience, uh, in our experience, typically our enterprise clients and our larger clients uh, paid on the most systematic and orderly basis. The smaller clients were complicated, and you know sometimes I'd be waiting for thirty, sixty, ninety days for an invoice that you know was twelve or thirteen hundred dollars. And quite frankly, the personal administrative friction of dealing with that invoice. Uh, far outweighed the value of it, waiting six months to get paid $1,300 because the check's always in the mail. So uh, one of the things that we did was to create this automatic incentive. It's right in the bill. If you pay this within 10 days, this is the amount. If you pay it after 10 days, then here's the other amount. It's a 2.5% discount. It's frankly not that much money. Uh, on $1,000, it's $25, uh, but who doesn't like to get a free $25 in their pocket? So they'll take it. The other thing that we instituted is that we use credit card payments. Um, uh, we, we take almost no checks. Um, checks are slow. Uh, they're slow for people to write. They're slow for people to mail. Then they have to mail it to your office. You have to pick it up and then you've got to walk it to uh, the bank. It adds at least four or five steps uh, to getting paid and there are four or five steps to getting paid that are not absolutely necessary So almost all of our clients are on wire transfers money goes directly into our account um, Or by credit card uh, Credit card is a bit of a complicated process in Ontario with Canadian banks and so we uh, after canvassing this in great detail uh, ultimately found a service called law pay and most lawyers who take credit card will use LawPay. Again, if you Google them, you'll find them very, very quickly. LawPay provides a credit card solution that is compliant with law society rules. Uh, the, short, the short of it is credit cards charge an amount against, your, um, uh, against, against each transaction. Um, if you operate a trust account, uh, that a little credit card fee violates trust accounting rules and the banks somehow have never figured out a way to service lawyers without that problem. Uh, law pay gets around that by ensuring that the full amount of the credit card payment from the client is deposited in your account. Uh, so if, the, if you invoice $1,000, you get $1,000. And the credit card fee is actually invoiced to you at the end of the month against your operating account. And so it's just a regular service, but you don't end up tripping over the trust system uh, trust accounting rules or any law society rules. Um, the adding both the incentive for a quick pay by giving them a few percentage points of a discount on top of adding the credit card payment I found has accelerated invoice payments dramatically. And, uh, and so I would recommend that if you're in a, a small business where you need to ensure good cash flow, that what you do is you take the steps to make it as easy as possible for clients to pay you as quickly as possible. And in our example, it would be wire transfers and credit cards. 
uh, and rapid invoicing as soon as you finish the work. Okay. So now we'll talk a bit about the day in the life. I think part of remote lawyering, and we'll, we'll dig into this a little bit, but lawyering can be an isolated profession at the best of times. And I think part of what is helpful about the office environment is that it puts a structure around things. So when Peter and I were comparing notes for this presentation, we came up with a couple of things that we each do to make our day, put boundaries around it and that kind of thing. The first thing to point out is, for anyone who's doing this for the first time, you may be shocked to see how much more time you have in your day. So it may feel to you like you're less productive because you're actually not working in the same way. And that's something to just get used to, Having hearing someone else maybe say to you that you're gonna have more hours in your day, so your work is gonna feel different. I think it, we both felt it was worth saying because it is one of the things that's a little bit hard to adjust to. You don't have, I used to have about a three, three and a half hour commute each day, which I have back now. So if I did nothing in my day, but work for those three and a half hours that I used to work, it would still feel like a very different day. So there's no water cooler. There's no person coming by open door policy, having a chat. We have a lot fewer meetings in person. So you'll find that as lawyers, particularly if you've been in-house or if you are in-house now, sometimes lawyers get roped into a lot of meetings that they, you wouldn't be in this remote work environment. So that's to be expected. I think that's pretty normal. And it's just a different rhythm of your day. So within that structure, within that different day, you've got to find ways that work for you to create structure, to put boundaries around yourself, to get your own discipline going on. And a lot of that has to do with routine, sort of basic, basic stuff. I mean, we asked Chris and Hirsch how basic to go on this and uh, we're gonna go pretty basic. <laughs> um, you know, if you get up in the morning and act like it's a weekend, you're gonna have a completely different mental state towards your day. So in my case, I get up, I pretty much, if I, most days, I am going to the office, just happens to be the office in my house. And we have to deal with the fact that that day has to be structured. So each of us has our own approach to, to how we structure our day. Do you want to talk about yours first, Peter? Well, I, uh, I'm a pretty simple guy. And I, uh, so I've just, uh, I talk about this bucket approach. I put my day into three categories, the stuff I have to do, uh, the stuff I should do, and the stuff I'd like to do. And, uh, and it's exactly in that order. And uh, then I know what I have to attack really quickly uh, in order to get myself to, to, to work down the list. So um, it's not that complicated. It does involve uh, typically writing physical lists, but that's a different topic for a different time. Uh, but the, uh, similar to what Darlene has described, and I think anybody who works from home for any length of time will agree that you have to you can't treat it like a Saturday and just sort of amble down to the kitchen and slowly pour a cup of coffee that you have to put yourself in the mindset of a professional delivering professional services. You're just not doing it from a conventional office location. Um, that gives you a certain amount of flexibility and latitude and you should, you should take advantage of that flexibility and latitude, but that doesn't give you such flexibility that you don't actually, you know, bear down and get the work done. So that's what I do. I just try to divide what I have to do, with what I want to do, uh, what I should do, and what I want to do, and, uh, and try to get through my lists every day. Yeah, I think if you're a person who is extrinsically motivated in that you react to people asking you for things rather than setting up your own schedule to get things done, work from home can be much more of a challenge. I, the to-do list is helpful. I, use, I used to use an app called Wonderlist, which was acquired by Microsoft because it's such a great app. The beauty of that app is it's a cloud-based to-do list and you can, you can prioritize things each day. So one thing that does not change about remote work is that there is a most pressing issue every day for a different client. So that to-do list allows you to real-time move things around on your to-do list, which I highly recommend, and to keep different to-do lists. So personal work, a certain client can have its own to-do list. And then I take a similar approach to Peter where I have each day things that have to get done. And sometimes those 
you know, a, a day at home can be very, very productive. If you can do four concerted hours, that's a big day at home with no interruptions. And I think if you, if you compare it to your work day, it's a little different once you're working from home five days a week. Many people will have had the experience of working from home one day a week or two days a week. Once you're home all the time, when you really put your hours across the week and account for the fact that the commute is gone, like I said, account for the fact that the recurring meetings are, are less, you're going to find that a day with four concerted hours of work is a big, that can be a big day. And I think for me, one of the things that I always struggle with is when you're an entrepreneur and a lawyer, or you know, both, both create this pressure, you have to sometimes just shut it off and just make a decision that once you've done a good day's work, once you've hit your top items, you're going to go for a walk. You're going to get out of the house. You're going to call someone. You're going to do something that's a little bit different because if you, if you are accustomed or in the habit of just churning away at work with the expectation that you're going to leave at some logical time, home work uh, can create real challenges that have to be overcome and just address, just be aware of them and, and manage it like you would any other life situation. So with that, we'll just jump ahead. Let's do a quick recap here. We did a few tips and tricks and then we're gonna go a little bit deeper into the mental game stuff. So um, Peter, why don't, if you do the first one, I'll do the next one. Yeah, so this is just a, a, a good communication strategy is very helpful, especially if you're transitioning from being in a conventional setting to now being into a remote setting. Make sure everybody knows. Uh, obviously in the current circumstances, everybody's going to completely understand. Uh, what you're doing and why you're doing it. But what you really want to be able to do is to communicate to all of your clients. And I, I said stakeholders really here, because it's not just about clients. It could be, uh, uh, it could be suppliers. It could be other lawyers uh, that you're working opposite. Um, it could be colleagues, uh, but make sure everybody knows where you are, what you're doing and how you're doing it. Uh, and this is a really powerful time to also create a great deal of confidence in the people in your professional circle uh, that while you may no, no longer be working from a physical office that they're used to, that you've taken into account everything you need to, that you have a, a proper workspace, that confidentiality is handled, communications are handled, and that nobody is going to experience uh, any kind of speed bumps along the way. So communicate and make sure that it's a, it's a regular form of communication to people. Certainly if you are newly making this transition, people will uh, do not, do not think that you should assume people know what you're doing or do not think that people are not interested in knowing what you're doing. And in, in fact, it'll be comforting to those stakeholders around you to know that you're on the ball, that you're working on it and that, uh, and that their needs will be met. Okay. Okay, so be available, but be sure to put boundaries, as we said. That can be so challenging. After you put the kids to bed at night, it's very hard when your work is your office and your office is your house, not to just jump back into work out of habit. There's always something that can be done and there are just decisions that have to be made. We talked about security. And then with mail at the moment, I think now is a really good opportunity to get away from mail if you can at all if you can take steps to have clients, as Peter said, stop mailing checks, things like that, it really does smooth and save so much time to have everything be online. Yeah, and But on a, on a personal security issue around that as well, you may not want your clients to know your home address. I can imagine that in a number of scenarios, particularly, I'd say, uh, in uh, criminal law. So uh, you don't have to give anybody your home address. You could always use a commercial service provider who gives a post office box, and uh, and you can ultimately use that as your commercial address and not your residential address. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about cash management. Dress for work, look professional. Get a, if you're gonna be doing remote screens, get a spot in your house that you don't have client information behind you. Understand that the, the client still needs us to look professional for them. So they don't want they want to feel uh, a minimal interruption in service between what they're used to. So if you've been working from an office and you've had the trappings of an office, you need to find a way to carry over that, that comfort. It can be comforting for clients. So we have to figure out a way to, to respect that. Um, maintain regular hours. 
I have little kids, so my hours are regular in their, in their strangeness, but the clients know to expect that. So part of that is just managing expectation. So if you don't work a normal nine to five day, then communicating with your clients about what your regular hours that they can reach you is, is very key. Okay. I'll talk about the mental game. This is the, this is an interest area of mine. And I think that for anyone who's coming out of the, uh, sorry, one sec. Um, for anyone who's coming out of an office, what you may not have thought about and something that I think Peter and I can share is that when you start working from home, you realize all of the structures that support your sense of self uh, that are present in an office. So, you know, you walk in, you see certain people, you see the security guard, you see the, your assistant, there's a lot of paper, there are fancy meeting rooms, whatever your situation is. And when you come home and are working from your home, especially in these current times where there are limited social outreach opportunities, what you'll find is you really have to just create your own sense of security without anyone bolstering your ego. So I called this in the presentation, the ego hit. Be aware of it. Use it as an opportunity, I would say, to figure out how little you need those things if they're, th if they're parts of your life that you've been depending on. They aren't necessary. And I think once you start working from home for a bit, I originally found it to just be a little bit humbling that I didn't have some of the supports that I used to have. There used to be a, a whole structure around helping me get my job done that I thought was necessary to get my job done. And then once, once I've started my own virtual practice, I've realized actually it, it wasn't so necessary. I think there will be a lot of people figuring out right now what is really required to get the work done and just, just be aware that that will happen. I put addiction on here because I think that having worked with a lot of people over the years who are coming home, being in their home environment all the time, not going to a formal environment anymore, one of the things that can come up for people is if you've been managing an addiction or a problem, whether it's a family problem or a relationship problem, by getting out of the house, that can come up full blown in a situation of working from home. So I would just say that lawyers as a profession, an, uh, an issue that I'm very interested in is making sure that we maintain our, we learn coping mechanisms and resilience tips to help with the stress level. It is an anxiety provoking profession and there is a high level of addiction in this profession. So just understand that working from home can trigger that, can make it worse. And if you need any kind of support, my recommendation would be just, it happens. It happens all throughout the profession and there are supports in place for it and just reach out before it's a crisis. So if you can see that that could be a risk, then reach out now would be my, my tip. Peter, jump in anytime here, but I'll just keep going if I don't see you. Well, it, so the, so I would just say the, the issue around that I always try to keep, uh, be mindful of and, and talk to people about is that um, question of time. Uh, because what you will find, I absolutely guarantee you is what, you know, whatever you do in a conventional office setting over the course of eight hours, uh, assuming you have undisturbed time in a remote setting, you will finish it in much less than eight hours. Uh, and so you'll have to find a way to use that time um, effectively. And, uh, and there is a strong emotional and psychological component to that that you have to be mindful of. I fully agree with everything Darlene has said. Yeah, so some of the things, if you've, had, if you've had as your coping strategy, speaking to colleagues at lunchtime, things like that, getting out into the hallways, you can all picture someone from your firm or your company that that's their coping mechanism if it's not you. It's really important early in this process to just start setting up routines and practices that you do. I try to get outside every day during the daylight hours to just be outside, get a minute, raise my head from work. <laughs> um, that's a really, really key thing. Obviously a little complicated now, but we are still allowed to go outside. So I would recommend doing that. Managing anxiety. I, I think that if you're prone to ruminating about client files, that's something that you have more time to do in a work from home environment with less distractions, less commute potentially. So again, whatever the tools are to work on that. 
whether it's meditation, exercise, conversation, reaching out to people. Distraction, I would say, when we've, uh, in the early years of working from home, a lot of people said, well, surely you watch Netflix in the middle of the day. And I said, no, I actually don't. I'm not a big Netflix person. But if you were, it's okay to have distraction. Just because your office, your home office is now your, your work and your life are completely intertwined now. So you also do have to allow yourself to still have relaxation in your space. Just has to have, again, back to the boundaries points. Um, and I think you can just keep working and working and working without any checks on your own behavior. So if you have any propensity towards workaholism, definitely <laughs> have to consider how to manage that in this work from home environment. So let's just see what the next one. The other thing is it's, if you are a social creature, I don't think there's anything wrong with admitting that working from home can be very lonely and isolating. And that is, I, I put in here, the Law Society has this member assistance program that I was uh, actually only recently became aware of. And it's this part I wasn't aware of. So we all know that there is this confidential health and wellness service, but they actually offer it to your family as well, which I think in this COVID time would be potentially very helpful. So if you are interested in that, it's in the same spot as all the other resources that we recommended. But volunteering, getting out of the house, service to other people, finding the others who are working like you, listening to podcasts, obviously connecting, staying connected with a bigger picture of other people who are working from home, I have found to be helpful. Peter, did you have a tip about that stuff? What, the only thing that I would add to this is that if you're, if you're used to working uh, in, uh, in, in a conventional setting with large groups of people, to be honest, a lot of this stuff just happens to you. Uh, you know, events are organized, birthday parties, drinks after work, uh, social events, closing parties, whatever the case may be, or someone just walking down the hall at 4 p.m. saying, hey, who wants to go grab a coffee with me? And so uh, if you're not particularly extroverted, uh, you can fall into uh, fall into a pattern where you really just rely on getting whatever additional social input you want and social interactive interaction on what people organize for you. And if that's the case, uh, then on your to do list is uh, on a daily basis is to figure out what it is that you need personally. Uh, in order to manage your own uh, mental health and well-being, because you're going to have to seek it out a little bit. Uh, you're going to have to reach out to people. You're going to have to talk to people because uh, you, you won't have a colleague walk down the hall at four o'clock and say, want to go to Starbucks. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can't have a virtual coffee with somebody else. Uh, and that may be, you know, I do virtual coffees with people. In fact, the wonderful thing with virtual coffees is I do with virtual coffees with people around the world. And have been doing that for uh, a very long time, not just people that work down the hall from me, but people that work many, many time zones away and we have them scheduled and they have their coffee. I have my coffee and we're able to catch up. But it's something you have to actually do. You have to make you have to exert a little bit of energy, exert a little bit of effort and organize it. It's not uh, it's not a completely uh, uh, spur of the moment type of thing. That's a great point. You get out of the day-to-day -day office environment, but you build this sort of global community through social media is very helpful with that work-related social media, obviously. But yeah, it's a, it's a really important point. Okay, I see Chris jumping on with questions. So that was, uh, that was fantastic. We've got about five minutes left, and if anyone has questions, uh, fire them in. I, I just want to go back uh, to one of what I took to be a really key point. Um, it's what works for you that matters most and not trying to recreate the office. And it will probably take people who are doing this for the first time a little while to figure out what really is going to work for them, isn't it? Yeah, I would say it took me probably, and this is a strange time, right? I would also flag for people that this is not traditional working from home. I am working from home with the kids, so is Peter. This is completely different than the norm, which for us has been without the kids at home. So there's an even higher degree of requiring routine, collaboration, coordination. 
in addition to the anxiety, which is over and above a typical law practice at the moment. But I think on the whole, it probably took me about a year to really unplug from needing the, so the, the standard social supports that I didn't know that I would miss, but did miss once they were gone. And that was in a pre-virtual time. I think the tools are much better. I mean, it was a virtual time, but things are much, much better now. And people are much more willing to hop on a Skype call or have a group text chat or anything than they were in those early days. So I think it could happen very quickly for people now. Yeah. And, and to, to Darlene's point about these are not normal times, uh, I mean, uh, it goes without saying, clearly, uh, but it's also not normal for home, home offices. You know, normally you would drop your kids off at school, then come back, the house is empty, and, uh, and, yeah. and you're empty, and now you have to create that work environment. Uh, and for the time being, none of us are going to have that. So we're going to have to come up with some strategies, you know, and they, listen, uh, full disclosure, before this one hour, I've got three boys in the house. And I told them before we got on that their next job was to go and agree on a movie that was at least 90 minutes long and to go down to the basement and watch it. Um, and, you know, we're going to have to find these little accommodations so that uh, you guys aren't entertained with my kids running in the screen behind me. Um, but what I would say to add to that is as lawyers, as professionals, let's everybody cut everybody just a little bit of slack uh, because we're all probably all dealing with some variation of that. We're probably all trying to stick handle uh, work from home, remote work, health issues, parents, children, trying to keep them on, on track with school, trying to understand what you're doing. There's, we'll all have full baskets in terms of what we're managing and so i would just ask everybody to uh to just uh to be understanding of our brothers and sisters at the bar and uh, and and lend a little bit of help where possible just picking up on that peter one of the questions was how do you tell a client um if your child or there's another disturbance in the house that's unexpected do you do you so, worry too much about it or yeah so i don't i don't worry too much about it um probably because i have uh i'm, I'm pretty open with my clients and they they know what the circumstances are but what i would say is that I, I i try to manage what's going on in the house so that everybody understands you know dad's you know dad's on a, an important call for the next little while you know everybody keep it down uh, but the other thing that I, I'm not uh, shy uh, of telling is telling clients, you know, what the situation is, particularly right now. So, you know, leave to the side right now. There are other times when I've uh, had a, a child home from school sick uh, and I'm in my work from home. This is before COVID. This is just a kid home with a fever. And, and I may proceed with a call, but I might tell my client at the onset, say, listen, guys, I'm working from home. And, uh, and one of my kids is homesick today. So, you know, I, I can only be on the call for the next 30 minutes, or I may be interrupted if, uh, if they wake up. And, uh, you know, my view is that most people are pretty understanding of that level of transparency. Most people are understanding of that kind of a life circumstance. And then if I may say so, um, if I have clients who are not understanding of that circumstance, then maybe they're not a good fit for me as a, one of my clients. One of the one of the issues that's come up is how do you how do you identify your client when you're working remotely or digitally? Um, what devices do you do and use, and and what uh, what do you have to do to make sure that you've got the right person and you're not passing doing work for somebody that uh, is not really your client. <laughs> I think that one I would throw to the Law Society website because they've issued guidance on how to do that remotely. And I think for different practice areas, it's probably very, very key to follow those guidelines to the letter. In my practice area, we are not usually dealing with individuals that often, and we're certainly not transferring money and things like that for individuals. So depending what your practice is, that's going to be a really important part of working virtually. And probably not uh, i don't know that peter and i with the nature of our practices are probably the ones to to give the best advice on that but there is good advice when i looked at the guidelines in preparation for this webinar i they are on it and when in doubt ask practice uh, management at the law society there's a hotline if you haven't 
if you haven't called it because you haven't set up your own practice yet, they are very helpful. And that might be a good note to sort of wrap this up on. Um, Darlene, why don't I ask you if you've got any last thoughts or words, and then I'll go to uh, Peter. Uh, my last thoughts would just be that, that sounds very foreboding actually, my last thoughts. <laughs> uh, in the current climate, I think the, the big thing is we, we have to keep a bit of a sense of humor. We're part of this profession where there is so much invested in these structures and these ways of doing things. And I think Peter and I both saw this presentation as a bit of an opportunity just to say, there are better ways of working. We don't need the paper. We don't need as many structures. We're obviously deep into this a few years in, but everyone who's coming to this now, you're benefiting from such an explosion of technology and understanding and work from home and the gig economy and very smart people working on workflow challenges. It's, it's actually a great way to practice. And I would speak highly about it. I love practicing this way. And if you're getting introduced to it through the pandemic, not the best introduction. And if you're struggling with it, 100% understandable. And I think just we have a culture as lawyers of not really talking about what's really going on sometimes. And I, I'm very focused on changing that and trying to get people to reach out and just acknowledge if we're struggling. So just that's my last thoughts. I don't know. <laughs> I might have more after those, but not for this webinar. Peter? Yeah, uh, thanks very much for that. I'd say um, uh, a few things. First of all, just because it's been done in a certain way in the past doesn't mean it has to be done this way forever. Um, our clients uh, pay us, in my view, um, our clients pay us to solve problems, to help solve problems in their life. Our clients do not pay us for time our clients do not pay us for the accoutrements of the legal profession. They don't really care about the mahogany boardroom um, and the delicious warm cookies that uh, some law firms think are critical to the delivery of legal services. What they pay us for is an ability to combine um, our knowledge, our experience, our judgment, and, uh, and our expertise and to wrap all of that into a solution that helps them solve a problem in their life. And really, uh, all you, you can have a very successful practice if you just figure out what is the minimum amount of infrastructure you need in order to do that, solve a problem. And, uh, and clients will be very happy to, uh, to hire you to solve those problems without all the other physical stuff. And then the last thing I would say, I think echoing Darlene's thoughts is that uh, uh, in, in this particular time, uh, we should all uh, just be mindful of the heightened level of anxiety and stress around everything that's happening. And uh, if you're being introduced to remote working because of the pandemic, um, there are resources, there are people that can help. We're happy to help uh, and let's just uh, be kind to each other. Well, thank you so much, Darlene. Thank you, Peter. Um, I know everybody watching has found this uh, extremely helpful. Um, some had been doing bits of it, maybe a lot of it over the years. Uh, most have not been forced to do this or have thought they should be doing this. Um, and the words of advice and wisdom and comfort you've given today are gonna be very, very helpful in the days and weeks to come. Um, to all those who've had the opportunity to tune in, we will be posting the recording. Give us about 24 hours. A couple of other things, and both Darlene and Peter alluded to this um, in some of their comments, as have some of you during the chat. I wouldn't be surprised if some of the rules and regulations that we used to take for granted uh, get massaged a little bit over the next week or two or three as people um, adjust to the reality where we have to do virtually everything online and at a distance. So I think we'll all keep, uh, keep our ears and eyes out for those and see what changes are made. Next Monday at 1.30, uh, Hirsch and I will be hosting our second lawyering from home. Um, 
this one, as I said at the outset, will be to follow a, a family file from beginning to end at 1.30. Um, remotely, digitally, how can you do the various things that you have to do? How can you manage the interactions when you don't get to sit down directly with people, when you don't get to, to speak to them in person, when you don't get to file the documents in person? Uh, how much of it can you do? And the second at 2.30 will be a civil file. Again, how do you do it when you're not in the presence of the people you're used to being in the presence of? Uh, we are trying to help the profession return some means of progressing with your client files, even when you're not used to doing things digitally, online, and remotely. Uh, we'll be posting information about that uh, within 24 hours. Um, on behalf of my colleague, Hirsch Perlis, who, of course, um, when we do this today, had so much to do with setting these up, but has been felled during the past hour from time to time with the um, tech gremlins. Um, but I know uh, Hirsch was determined that we provide service immediately to the profession, many of whom want to know who to turn to. Darlene and Peter, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your efforts. Uh, great supporters of innovation for many, many years. Um, we will be speaking again to all those who participated on the chat. Thank you very much. Um, everybody, please be safe. Safe yourself, healthy yourself, healthy, healthy your families. And we'll speak to you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.